performing for Hamilton College Jazz Archive at the San Diego Jazz Party in San Diego, California. I'm pleased to have Peter Eklund, cornetist, and I hear sometimes whistler. Yes, cornetist and private guitarist also. Private guitarist, yes. okay. Yes, yes. As, uh, as my guest today, um, can I ask you about your instrument first? Yeah. It's, it's a cool looking one. Well, this uh, actually it was made uh, maybe 75 miles from here in Fullerton. And uh, I think it's a copy of an old instrument, but I really don't know what. I've tried to get the guy who built it on the, on the phone, but I haven't succeeded. Oh. But basically the reason I play this in, in small groups, it's got, uh, I always play trumpet in big bands, but this, the low notes come out better. And it has, I think, a more interesting sound as a solo voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a big difference between cornet and trumpet. And you can get trumpets that sound like cornets and cornets that sound like trumpets. But in general, it's a bit mellower. And uh, uh, there's more variety in sound that you can get out of it uh, between the mellowest and the brightest sound. So you, could, it's, you can be a little bit sort of more vocal on it. It's, it's not a huge difference, but mm -hmm. it's not as easy to play the high notes, but uh, uh, the low notes sound better. As a matter of fact, you mentioned playing a high note. I noticed on one of the tunes I just heard you play down there, I think it was um, I'm in the Mood for Love. Yeah. And I got to the end of that, and you were playing the melody and the lead, and it ended up on a pretty high note. Yeah. And, um, well, that's sort of a, I, a standard. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, you could say it's a cheap trick, but it generally works, particularly yeah. in, in a kind of semi-chaotic situation like yeah. that. If you just find a good sounding high note and hold it at the end, then it kind of doesn't matter what happens. It kind of covers over it everything. It attracts attention. Yeah. yeah well, I, and, and as you said, it was semi-chaotic. And as, as the band kind of found the end there, I wondered right. how long they were going to keep you hanging up there. Well, I took a good a good breath before I started. Yeah, I knew it was going to be a probably, while. Yeah, you knew <laughs> it was going to happen. Yeah. Well, we'll talk some more about that. I, when, when you meet uh, someone new, you get into conversation with them, if they have no idea who, who you are, and if they ask you what you do for a profession, do you have a short answer and a long answer? Well, I say I'm a musician. And does that then say, oh, well, what do, what kind of music do you play? And then I say I say I, I play, uh, old jazz and I play commercial music. Mm -hmm. Now, the music that we were playing that that you were playing earlier, is that old jazz for you? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's more. What, I do more of that than any other kind of music. Mm -hmm. But I've always considered myself a musician rather than a jazz musician. I mean, I don't like calling myself a jazz musician to people because that they have a, a, a whole list of expectations about what I'm supposed to, how I'm supposed to be, which most of which I probably don't satisfy. So rather than disappointing them, I just prefer to call myself a musician. Uh huh. What kind of expectations do you think they have? Well, that about a lifestyle. Um, like the older people uh, expect Wild Bill Davison or something like that. And the younger people expect um, kind of the whole bebop, uh, not the music, but kind of the character. I mean, that's sort of an, an, the bebop character and attitude. Mm -hmm. um, you were you mentioned Wild Bill Davison, and I wonder if do you fit yourself into a line of trumpet players? Do you think were there people that you listened to? when you were coming up learning the instrument that became part of your sound? Oh, yeah. I mean, every, every musician who plays improvised music goes through this. I mean, you have to in order to. It's improvising, creating an improvising style is kind of like creating your personal language. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to kind of put together your vocabulary. It's kind of a language that only you speak. And you put it together out of various things that you hear around you. and. Uh, so, sure, I mean, I, I played nothing but classical music until I was, pretty, was almost finished with college, but I'd always listened to a lot of jazz, uh, traditional jazz and like Miles Davis and like that.
Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I got interested in traditional jazz because the father of a friend of mine had a very good record collection and was interested in that. And my, my friend played trombone, and he played trumpet. And he had played with uh, Rudy Valley's orchestra back in the 1920s, so mm. he knew a lot of those old songs and like yeah. that. Was there one particular person, jazz trumpeter, who made you really sit up and say, that's, that's somebody I'd really like to see? Well, I guess like. I liked Big Spiderbeck and Louis Armstrong back in, the, in those days, and mm -hmm. of course I still do now. Right. I, I, I had a feeling you might say that, yeah. listening, listening to what you play, yeah. that, that I could hear that in, in your sound. Can you explain, this is always a tough question, you, in fact, you came through the classical school. Right. If you had a, were explaining to a person who, who knew music pretty well, but just had no idea how musicians go about improvising, the, the thought process, when you're playing on Ain't Misbehavin', for instance, can you describe what you're thinking while you're playing? Yeah, you know, I've thought about that a lot since I've, I've been teaching improvising. I, uh, for the past four or five years, I've been teaching maybe three weeks a year at a uh, camp run by a violinist named Jay Unger, who did a lot of the music for, he does a lot of Ken Burns scores uh, for the, you know, like the Civil War and like that. And uh, teaching people who can play but don't improvise, it's, it's a combination of things. One is having things to play, like little stuff that you can play if you can't think of anything better to play, mm -hmm. then, then knowing the, not really the chords of the song so much as how the voices move in the song. If you play a one note at a time instrument, that's really what you're doing. You're not thinking like C7 to F7, although you know that's going on. You're thinking like what voice moves to which and what, how a note is going to sound in a particular harmonic setting as, you, as you're playing along. And then, uh, what I tell my students is uh, even more important than knowing every chord is knowing where you are in the song. It, I mean, that's really more important than anything. Knowing the form and, yeah, and feeling right. where you're right. at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you ever have an occasion on any of these parties where that goes out the window? Well, there are certain tunes that, that, are, that are, like there are certain tunes that are two 16-bar patterns that are almost the same. And that, that can happen like during a during a drum solo or something, you really have to just remember where oh, you are. Yeah. And uh, but the musicians that do these parties are very good. I'd say that happens very rarely. Yeah, rarely. Um, did you know every tune they played? Yeah. That first set, yeah. you did. Yeah. I saw at one point. In fact, I heard a couple of key changes. Yeah. In in tonight, and you, I don't usually hear that. In fact, I saw you in the middle of one tune. I think it was after. Marty Gross had um, sang it through, that you pretty um, uh, physically went out and exactly, yeah. went you like this to, to the band. You got to, everyone has to know before it happens or you're in trouble. Were you going to two sharps? Is that what uh, you were doing? Two flats. You were going yes. to two flats. Well, that, you're, you're right. That is the, the, the universal symbol for sharps is this and flats is that. But in fact, it's too difficult to do that. Like if everyone's standing up, you can't go like this. And so, and nearly, <laughs> nearly everything we play is either in C or in flat keys. Yeah. We're not going to play anything in D. We might play something in the key of G, but. Uh, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So since, well, it's because of these instruments. They're made yeah. in flat keys. Yeah. Clarinets and right. trombones and saxes. So, uh, so. It's, since it's very unlikely, you can just hold up fingers and people will know that chances are it's flats. Yeah. I wonder how many people in the audience knew what you were doing. Uh, probably not too many. Yeah. But uh, modulations are good. It's, it's a way yeah, of, you, oh, it just, yeah, it was a real refreshing it changes thing. the texture immediately just because it puts all the instruments in different registers. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of bringing some variety to the sound. Right. A typical week. Uh, um, uh, where do you live? New York City. Okay, and you were born when? Uh, 1945. Okay, so how come when you were, oh, 12 years old? Yeah. In uh, 1957. 1957, yeah. 
How come you didn't get into rock and roll? Well, um, or did I didn't you? hear any. I mean, my, uh, my parents had uh, classical music and they had Broadway music, and that was about it. And rock and roll, at, I mean, it was very strong at that time, but it kind of, it didn't have the respectability among uh, people who thought they were intellectuals that it had just a few years later, like when I went to college. Mm. Oh. Um, it was kind of a, a hoodlums and juvenile delinquents music. The so, blackboard jungle. <laughs> right. Um, it's funny. It's it's funny. It's like the same. It occupied the same role that that rap music occupies now. But that I mean, the Beatles came out, I guess, just before I entered college, and that really changed everything. That 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 meant that rock took over popular music. Uh, but I really, I mean, I was familiar with it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a big part of my life. I just heard classical music and Broadway shows, mm -hmm. Broadway music. Were your parents um, supportive of your music endeavors? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm not so sure they were so happy when I became a musician. That was many years later, but they certainly supported my musical endeavors. Uh -huh. I mean, I was really doing nothing but classical music then, but uh, I was interested in jazz. Mm -hmm. I listened to it a fair amount. So, typical week for a trumpet player or and cornet player living in New York City could be what? Well, I should. Uh, I can tell you my weeks. Everyone, especially now, because the music business is so fragmented, everyone really does different things, it seems. I, uh, maybe I do more than most, but I think it's not that atypical. Uh, let's see. Next week, I return to New York on Monday, uh, and I play at a place called Michael's Pub, operated by the original owner of Michael's Pub. And it's basically a scam. It's a way of uh, getting people tourists who don't realize that Woody Allen has moved on to another place <laughs> to come out and thinking that, that he might be there. Yeah. But it's a job, so I'm doing it. Yeah, uh, sure. Were you playing when Woody Allen was there? Uh, from time to time. It, there was, yeah. I, I wasn't doing it all the time, but mm -hmm. I, I did, did play with him maybe eight or ten times a year, and I played in one of his recordings. But I haven't played with him in a number of years. How does he play? Uh, he's not a, really a very good musician, but in a way he is because he, uh, he, has, he really understands kind of where that music is coming from. He just doesn't have very many skills. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of, I mean, uh, in, in terms of his perception of how it's supposed to feel, he's really pretty good. I mean, and... Uh, it's it's certainly the strangest job I've ever done, uh, by far. It's it's the strangest. I mean, er, any musician will tell you that because it's not really about music. Uh, whenever whenever I played at the old Michael's Pub, people were always going like this, because b being up there, I was in the way, so they couldn't see him. And I mean, they weren't <laughs> they really were looking at yeah. you. <laughs> and I was always waiting for someone to. Uh, take out a silver-handled revolver or something, <laughs> because you know any celebrity is. I, I would imagine Woody was thinking, must have been thinking about that all the time too. So far, it hasn't. So he happened. wanted you to stay right in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> you stay right where you are. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And that was pretty straightforward. Um, Dixieland. That was New New Orleans revival style. That's okay. What, that's what he. That's what he likes. He plays kind of like George Lewis. Um, um, that's music I heard. In the late 60s, when I was in college, I made a lot of trips to New Orleans and vacations and heard some of that music when it was still pretty decent at Preservation Hall and all that. And that was really a great experience. Okay. Well, I want to come back to that for a minute, but OK, we're, we're just at the beginning of your week. Right. And you've done that gig. And you know what's next on your calendar? Uh, then the following day, I go up to uh, near Woodstock, New York. and. I've got a recording session with Jay Unger and Molly Mason and a steel guitar player and a studio drummer 
and bass, bass player and a few other people. A uh, few songs are for my album that I'm making for Arbor's Jazz, and a, a few songs will be for an album that I'm producing that uh, this uh, lady who sings for swing dances up in the Albany area. Oh. So I'm, since none of this pays very well, I'm putting it all together so sure. everybody who participates can make a little money. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm doing on Wednesday. And let's see. Oh, two, no, that's Tuesday I'm playing someplace for Mardi Gras. Wednesday I'm doing the recording. Um, Thursday, uh, I'm, I, either Thursday or Friday, I've got uh, some kind of, uh, it's either a, a demo or a self-produced album that someone is doing, like some singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's about all I remember so far. I yeah. Well, every day is different then. Right. And uh, do you handle your own business? Yeah. You uh, only really famous musicians have agents yeah. because there's not enough money right. in any one job to really justify the, the, right. the trouble. It's, it's yeah. not like booking someone for a movie or something uh -huh. like that. Yeah. Did it take a while to establish your reputation in New York? Well, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I was able to start working. I really did pretty well when I started out in the 70s. Um, it was very different then from how it is now. But, mm -hmm. but uh, cause I got in with a lot of singer-songwriters who wanted um, like horn arrangements and, and things for There was a lot of recording going on. So I did that. And I was also playing some traditional jazz. So uh, that's really how I got started as a full-time musician. You ever travel overseas? Yeah, I, I go overseas quite often. I'm going in, uh, next time will be in June, actually. But uh, I've worked in France quite a bit over the past 10 years, also in Germany, so. Is it these kind of, th this kind of uh, setting where you're playing with just an, an ensemble of, of guys who hopefully know the same genre Well, it's a little music. more organized than that. Um, mostly in France, I play with French musicians. Uh, there's one group I play with that plays maybe just four or five times a year. It's myself and three French trumpet players in the rhythm section. And it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's not a terribly slick group, but it's, it's something that people seem to like, so hmm. it's, it's fun to do. And then I play some festivals in, in Europe with, uh, mostly with European musicians. Those are organized kind of informally, but uh, it's, uh, they're people I've played with before. Mm -hmm. Do they approach the music uh, differently at all? Yeah. I mean, everybody, it's funny, everybody aspires or, or pretends to aspire to play authentic jazz, but in fact, every co nobody really plays it the way it was because, I mean, even in America, we're, we're in America today, not America of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Yeah. So there's this whole other experience we have of like playing music that's happened since then. And in Europe, they have other musical traditions that you can't help um, affecting uh -huh. how people play, even if they're playing the same notes. And I think that's fine. It just makes things, gives things character and makes them more interesting. Mm -hmm. No one plays like the music was played in the 20s and 30s. Um, well, I mean, there are some people who, who play very well, but it's not the 20s and 30s. So, right. so uh, in that sense, I mean, you can't. A musician can't divorce themselves from all the th things that are happening now or have happened well, since then. Well, you. I guess you could, but uh, just people's experience of music is different now. I mean, most of that music was for dancing. And I've, lately I've been playing a lot more for dancing, but when I was playing this music, it mostly wasn't for dancing. And that, that affects very greatly, I mean, how it's played and how you play. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and peop most people's experience of music is now is television and recordings. And just the way people experience music is very different from, especially before the 1920s, before the big boom in, uh, in, in, 
the, in the record business in, in, the, in the 1920s. People's experience of music was just very different. Was to, to go actually hear it. To go hear it or to hear player pianos or to create it themselves by playing the piano and singing uh -huh. and like that. Yeah. We talked uh, a little bit, I think, before the camera was rolling about uh, this festival and uh, the future of this festival, these kinds of festivals. And uh, you had mentioned the Trad Jazz right. Festival. Now, um, the organizers of these festivals, when they say Trad Jazz, can you tell us what they mean by that? Uh, they mean organized bands. Uh, mostly uh, not full-time musicians, some of them very good, some of them not so good, that play a more organized repertory than, and maybe not with the same expertise that you get here, but that put on more of a show, and uh, sometimes a very hokey show, sometimes a good show. Uh, but those, uh, and have a following, uh, usually developed by playing in, in some a local club and having a mailing list. A lot of these bands that are uh, part-time musicians are really much more business-like than, than full-time musicians because <laughs> this, this is what they do when they're not at the office and they use the same skills. I mean, marketing and, <laughs> and uh, mailing lists and internet and all that. And some of them, some of them are very good and, and do very well. That's very interesting, you know, like, I mean, the band like the Bearcats and all those right. kind of those yeah. local things. And so if you go to those things, you're going to see a group of people who've played together a lot, right. rehearsed. And, like, and I mean, a band I fill in for sometimes, the new Black Eagle Band in Boston, uh, they're mostly not full-time musicians. And if you heard them individually, you might or might not think that there was something special, but together they've got a real sound that's kind of unmistakable. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do very well. I mean, I don't know if they still do, but uh, that w even though they all have jobs, that was a big part of their income. Oh. Well, when, when did you first become aware of these kinds of festivals, the San Diego and the L.A. Classic Festival and, and those kinds of things? I mean, they've been going on since, I guess, the 70s. Right. With Dick well, Gibson and... Well, Dick Gibson is a jazz party situation. That's a little different. Uh, the ones with the the mostly amateur bands are, are more like Sacramento, and right. like that. And there, there are more of them on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. But that's just, it's a place to play and uh, a place to, you know, acquire a following and, and like that. There's really only one in the East that, that I do with my own group. It's uh, the, uh, the one in Connecticut. And we played there with the Orphan Newsboys a few times. Uh -huh. The group I play with is Marty Gross. Do you find uh, that if you do is it word of mouth that gets you into these things? I guess so. I mean, uh, I really, I really don't know. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't do a great deal of promotion myself. Uh -huh. I, I should be doing more. But I mean, if you're a full-time musician, the, the trouble is, these jobs. I mean, especially the the trad jazz festivals. They don't really pay that well. They're good for acquiring a following and for selling lots of CDs, but. They don't pay as well as some of the other work I do, uh -huh. so it's a little hard to get motivated to, oh, yeah. to, to find that kind of work exclusively, as opposed to uh, um, some of the better paying work I do. It might actually cost you to come to one of these the trad jazz well, festivals. Well, it probably wouldn't you, cost, but you know I, I might. But if you give oh, and then we, and then get a call to like play some festival in Europe, you know, for three times as much money, and yeah. have to turn it down because I'd already yeah. signed a contract here, right, or some other place, right. I mean, this is all not very interesting, but it's kind of the mechanics of running a small business, which is basically what being a musician is. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're a small businessman. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about getting involved in the the PBS thing with um, Ken Burns. Well, I've never met Ken Burns, and yeah. I've, I've played on three of his soundtracks. Uh, I hear a lot about him, but I've never <laughs> yeah. met him. Yeah, I just know the people who do music for him. You know he's working on a jazz song yeah. now. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And I, since I've never met him, I have only the best things to say about him. <laughs> but you but did the Civil War one, right? 
Well, actually, I just played on, it's funny, I just played on a few cues. It's, and, uh, but for some reason, my name was at the end of every single episode. And, the, and one of the cues that I played on, although it was only like uh, uh, maybe 45 seconds, was, it was really kind of interesting. It was the, uh, during the siege of Petersburg, there was a Confederate cornet player who played a particular tune at sundown, I believe it was, every oh. day. And so there was nothing else going on except, except uh, the music for this particular 45 seconds. And for some reason, a lot of people noticed that, even though if it was uh -huh. basically pretty insignificant. So it's funny how those things work. Yeah. I mean, you do these recordings all the time, and mostly you never hear about them. And every once in a while, one of them, people notice. You go, hey. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. Are those things... Um, is there a union a standard fee for those kinds of? Yeah, increasingly the work I do is not through the union, but oh. uh, but there is there is uh, particularly not just the fee, but for uh, reuse of the, that's reuse of the music for other purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's always a problem when you when you do something without a union contract. You can it can appear anywhere, and you know it can be used a hundred times in a hundred different settings and you'll never see oh. any more music. Any well, more that's, that reminds me of the articles you see in the union newspa newspapers, right. you know, why you should be in the union, yeah. why you should have a union contract. Well, they're in a tough position because the music business keeps contracting all the time and the truth is people don't really need music and they don't need musicians either. They can get by with synthesizers and, and canned music that they can buy without having to pay any yeah. rights. So the Musicians Union is in a difficult position. Yeah, increasingly. I'm glad to have something that I do that's kind of distinctive so that it's a little more difficult to replace what I do with a synthesizer than if I were just, you know, a reading musician. Yeah. So. When you did the PBS things, was this horn? I, I didn't have this horn then. Oh. It was a horn like that, yeah. Was it, and did it help to have an older horn for that sound, or well, it didn't? Well, it's not really the age, it's, it's the configuration of the pipe. Like, it starts smaller than a trumpet here and keeps getting larger and larger. These are different sizes, and so it's more conical, and it has, it has a more characteristically mellow tone. Uh -huh. Not as much as the flugelhorn, but uh, kind of halfway between. Um. <laughs> I had to laugh when, when Marty was talking about, you know, he was actually rehearsing you guys on stage or yeah. handing out instant arrangements. Right. And, you know, he says, "I'll do this, and you guys mutter, mutter behind him." Yeah. Now, when you set up your set, is it get increasingly hard as the weeks, as not as the weeks, as the days go by at these festivals, to set up, if you're the leader, to do a set, because now you're thinking, well, gee, those guys did that yesterday. Well, Does it cut down on the, your repertory choices? It, it should. In fact, I don't hear every set, so I might play right. something tonight that, that's already been played. Yeah. The problem with this particular event is that there's so many horn players. Yeah. There are not that many tunes, as you know, that, sound, that you can fall into harmonies easily and that sound good with harmonizing the lead and like that. Yeah. I mean, if we play, tried to play Deep Purple with four horns or something, I mean, we'd be in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. And that really limits the repertory and and also you you have to give everybody solos because that's why they're here so it tends to make the tunes too long right and it's 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 really kind of difficult yeah to make consistently interesting music mm -hmm. marty i think is one of one of the best at that i mean he just i mean he, at least he makes he really makes an effort certainly got a sense of humor too yeah you have any um beefs with the music business these days that you run across in your particular field? Well, I suppose I should. It's, I mean, you get so used to taking things as they are and trying to, trying to take it, find a way to take advantage of them that that sort of discourages. I mean, it's easier to have beefs if you're not, if you have some other means of support. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> good point. But uh, it's, we're in kind of an interesting time now, I think, because I mean, when I was younger, 
rock was sort of the all-encompassing. It was the only music that a lot of people my age thought should ever exist or, or, <laughs> or, or, did. or did, yes. But now I think it's getting kind of played out. So it, it's actually, it's actually m more interesting in general in the music business now that it's so fragmented and that there's so many styles. There's, I mean, there's always a lot of me mediocrity and there's certainly plenty of mediocrity now, as, but there's no like one thing that has everyone's imagination. So I think um, although the business, it's not a very good time to be a musician. It's sort of an interesting time to be around music. Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly a lot of uh, styles, uh, Cajun music and, and things well, that are Well, there's a, a, a lot of focus on the past just in general. Uh, in all, uh, in all kinds of music. I mean, rock music now, pop music. I just did a a, a tour with um, the singer Madeline Peru and uh, opening for Sarah McLachlan, who's like a pop singer. And uh, I got to know the musicians and and the music. And I'd, I'd kind of been away from that scene for a while. And it's like. Musicians who play pop music basically study everything that's happened in the past 30 or 40 years and kind of synthesize things sort of the way I've done with traditional jazz. It's not like everybody's rushing out to buy the latest album by so-and-so to find out what the new things are to do because there really aren't any. They're just kind of new instruments and new ways of mixing old stuff together. Oh. Uh, and that seems to be true across the board in most kinds of music. And some of the more interesting music that's happening now, I think, is uh, mixtures of things that have been around for a while. And I think that's, in music, that's generally the way I, things are. But it's like, since we have this, uh, since, I guess, since maybe the turn of the century, music is kind of a generational thing. Each generation has to kind of destroy the music of the past and create a new kind of music. And uh, but the trouble is, pr trouble is now they've sort of run out of things to do. Mm -hmm. um, did I see on your little resume here that you had played with the Grateful Dead? Well, I recorded with them. I played for a long time with a, a guy named David Bromberg, who was uh, oh sure. Um, I played in his band for about six years. That's really, I think, what makes me different from a lot of other musicians is I had that experience, like just uh, music and music like that, which is basically a mixture of many kinds of American music. Uh, it was basically a band that played traditional music of many different kinds, kind of gussied up with a rock rhythm section. And, uh, yeah. uh, and David is a very good showman, so it's a, it's a band that I think the records were never quite as good as the shows, but mm -hmm. uh, that was a really great experience. I learned a lot of stuff about oh, country music and, and uh, bluegrass and, and old-timey music like Celtic music and, and uh, blues and things that trumpet players who were like spending their lives sitting on the bus in Stan Kenton's orchestra or just never get exposed to. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, in a way, that kind of held me back from being a super accomplished um, big band player and like that, but mm -hmm. I really learned a lot of music that way, so yeah. it was a really great experience. But you have done some big band Oh, yeah. Playing. Well, since, since the 70s, I've gotten a lot better at that stuff, so uh -huh. actually I do that a fair amount, but it's not how I started. That's, yeah. that's how a lot of horn players start. I've heard there's there's a number of functioning big bands in New York. Yeah. You get involved and in, get calls to do that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, I'm not really in any one of them, but I'm, I'm kind of a sub for a lot of them. I kind of prefer that, actually, because yeah. you get a lot of different experiences. There's one I play with, run by a guy named Tony Corbicello, that's really very good, that does like 50s and 60s stuff, which is music that I really know less well than others, so it's really, it's really uh, a lot of uh, a lot of fun to do that. Then another band 
that does 1920s music, which is a bit like a band I used to play with called Vince Giordano's Nighthawks. Oh, yes. That, uh, uh, so those are the big bands I'm playing with occasionally now. Uh-huh. Vince is the bass saxophonist, is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And his music is based on the bands of, of the 20s? Of the 20s, yeah. Like, like whom? Um, Oh, well, he was thinking of, I guess, with the name Coon Sanders Nighthawks and, yeah. and uh, uh, Don Redmond, Fletcher Henderson, uh, the, uh, all the dance orchestras, Gene Gold, Goldcat, all of those. Now, what kind of functions in New York City does a band like that play? Well, he had quite a bit of success, um, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, doing... Uh, society parties. It was this band had kind of an elegant sound and he'd play a certain amount of uh, more standard dance music like shuffles and a few rock tunes but basically the 1920s and so I'd say society parties and, mm -hmm. and fundraising events and things like that. He's out of the music business now except as a sideman oh. but uh, he had a number of good years doing that. If you had any, um, if, if you had a nephew or something like that, or a niece that was going to aspire to be a musician like yourself, would you have any words of advice for them? Well, I, th I think it's really important to have uh, you have to be able to play your instrument well and have a lot of certain basic skills. I mean, it's not because it will hold you back if you don't like being able to read music and play in tune and and uh, uh, listen to listen carefully to what other people are doing, play in with good rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then it's also important to really have to know certain things really well uh, to really master as many styles as, as you can. But uh, there are a lot of people that do one without the other, and you, sooner or later it catches up to them. Mm -hmm. did, were you at, uh, did you go to music school? No. Okay. So your, your training came mostly from listening and experiencing. Well, I took lessons, and I s took music courses in yeah. college, although I didn't, okay. uh, I didn't major in music. Right. And uh, I uh, uh, played in orchestras and like that. Mm -hmm. But that actually turned out to be a pretty good background. Mm -hmm. I think better than the jazz education I see now, a lot of which, I mean, some of it is very good, but a lot of it seems to me to be just a way to get people to play something that sounds a little bit like jazz quickly and efficiently without necessarily knowing exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. or really playing anything very good. Uh, but uh, that's all been mostly created since I was in college. I really don't know a lot about it. Sometimes I'm, I'm impressed and sometimes I'm not. Yeah. It certainly has been uh, put into the institutions and, you know, there's lots and lots but of things you can buy to help you. Yeah. yeah. But I think just by itself, jazz is a little too narrow. I mean, it's something that you could devote your life to after you decide either to be a professional musician or someone who plays music a lot. But as a way of learning music, it, but to start with that as an exclusive approach to music, I think is is a little bit stupid. It's like deciding that you know you're only going to uh, uh, study 19th century art songs or, or something like that. And no, that's a good analogy, actually. I mean, the history of jazz is is not that old. No. To 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 go to school specifically. And, just it, to and do it's that. it's composed of so many elements that are also very old. I think it's really more important to know what what it comes from, as much as it is to know what it is. And if you're talking like the uh, the kind of the kind of flowering period of jazz in the 50s and 60s, that's really a very short time. And uh, 
it's also extremely difficult music to play well. I'd say, I'm. I, I mean, I, I like bebop when it's played well, but it almost never is. <laughs> it's 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 really very difficult music, and um, when you put on one of those those great Blue Note albums and you hear like some modern day group, it. I think it's probably. Uh, it falls short even more than the efforts of myself and my friends to play old music falls mm -hmm. short. Just not for no other reason than the music is more difficult. Yeah. Um, Anybody out there that you enjoy listening to today? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I like some of the players here. Um, among the sort of younger generation of players, I think the one I like... I like Roy Hargrove. He's very good. Uh, a lot of them I'm not really that familiar with. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know how it is in music. There's some things that you recognize are, that are very good, but they just don't happen to appeal to you. So uh, You can recognize the talent, but it's not necessarily your... It's not a... Couple. Right, or what, you, what interests you. Uh -huh. Any plans for recording coming up soon? We mentioned your own Yeah, well, I'm doing project. another album for Arbor's Jazz, uh -huh. which is kind of a, a mixture of, of, it's mostly original music, actually. And it's music inspired by situations I've been in, and, and uh, it's all instrumental, of course, but it's music that seems to be pretty conservative to me, but it's it's not exactly old jazz, it's not exactly anything, it's kind of a mixture of oh. things that I, and I did an album like that uh, for Arbors, which I, I really respect Matt Dumber for encouraging me to do that, because it's not exactly the kind of music he has, although it's, mm -hmm. it's really pretty conservative, and I don't know that it sold a lot, but it got some nice reviews, so I'll con continue in that direction. Yeah. I try to perform that music as much as I can. Of course, I can't do it here. I mean, right. I might try one piece in, in my own set, which right. is coming up later. But. Well, it's nice to be able to write your own yeah. stuff and have an outlet for it, too, because someone should be writing tunes for the future. Well, that's one odd thing about traditional jazz is that no one does that. I mean, in every other kind of music I played, everyone did that yeah. as a matter of course, and no one thought very much of it either. But uh, Right. Uh, for some reason, it's like you only play, you know, the great songs of, of the 20s, 30s, and yeah. 40s. I suppose they're looking out there at the audience. and Well, that, and I mean, that too. Right. right. Well, I wish you a lot of luck with your, okay. your future recordings and uh, hope that we run into you again at one of these festivals. Yeah, well, nice talking and to you. And good luck coming up with a, with a nicely balanced set. Okay. Considering the line of horn players you right. have to work with. I think it's like three trumpet players or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Oh, Maybe we'll do Carnival of Venice. And, yeah, and, Bugler's uh, Holiday. Bugler's Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and Mahler, well, maybe Mahler's Fifth. I was thinking of doing that. As Tommy Newsom says, that would be Clear the Room. This song's yeah. called Clear the Room. Right. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Okay. Okay.